Hello, this is Dr. Ford Brewer with PrevMed, heart attack, stroke, cancer, disability prevention. Um, <clears throat> prevention can seem more difficult. It takes uh, discipline and behavior change. But uh, ask the folks that have had um, bypass graft or are looking for a cure for their cancer. Uh, in the long run, prevention's better. Today we're going to be talking about the gut biome, the bacteria in the colon and its impact on uh, weight, weight gain, weight loss, even insulin resistance. There's going to be something about artificial sweeteners here, too. You've been by the TV, you've seen uh, shows saying, well, um, artificial sweeteners can make you gain weight or artificial sweeteners can um, cause insulin resistance. Here's where that's coming from. This is a Scientific American article in 2015. Artificial sweeteners may change our gut bacteria in dangerous ways. <clears throat> they were quoting a, a, this article. It's from Nature Magazine. It came from the Weissman Institute in, um, in uh, Israel. The Weissman Institute's doing a lot of very interesting, groundbreaking research right now in terms of the gut biome and weight gain and artificial sweeteners. Um, this one is titled, this is the one that the Scientific American article was quoting. Artificial sweeteners induce glucose intolerance or insulin resistance um, al by altering the gut microbiota. In other words, the... Um, the bacteria in the gut. So, again, Nature Magazine is very, very well respected. You're going to see some really good science in here. Most of this is around showing insulin um, or, or oral glucose tolerance testing for these animals and um, bacterial components. I blew a couple of, the, couple of those up to basically uh, make it easier to see. This is the oral glucose tolerance testing. Um, this lower line is the control group. The upper line is the group that took saccharin, as you can see, saccharin-treated uh, animals. And their fasting glucose, as well as their immediate post-challenge, and one hour and two hour. Very different. And again, it does appear that saccharin increased, uh, created insulin resistance in these animals. One thing they went on to do was give them antibiotic, and they were able to um, and put, a, put new uh, bacteria back in to these animals with a gut transplant and uh, reverse that insulin resistance. So very interesting results and very compelling. Now, what are they doing to the uh, gut bacteria? There are a lot of different types of bacteria in our colon, in our gut, but uh, research has already shown that you can break them, for the most part, into two different types, the bacteroides uh, type and firmicutes. This, um, this was showing that bacteroides are significantly increased by saccharin. Now, <clears throat> they looked at these, uh, they looked at insulin uh, resistance a different way, or uh, blood glucose value averages a different way. Hemoglobin A1c is a common test. In fact, it's the test that's most um, often used these days for insulin resistance or diabetes. That's unfortunate because it has a significant number of uh, false positive, or actually more false negatives. Bottom line, though, is they checked that as well, and sure enough, you see this group has a higher hemoglobin A1c, or average, two-month average, blood glucose. Well, which group was this? This is the group that had high NAS consumption, in other words, non-nutritive artificial sweeteners. In other words, the sucralose, aspartame, um, saccharin group. And you, you may say, well, I don't, uh, I don't use saccharin. Well, it, if you drink diet soft drinks, you drink uh, aspartame. Now, <clears throat> here's another, uh, another piece of research around gut bacteria and um, obesity. 
In this one, it was an interesting twin study. This was quoted in the New York Times, picked up there and, uh, and described. So the, in this twin study, they found human twins. One was obese, one was uh, thin. They took the uh, fecal material from these individuals and um, transferred them to uh, laboratory mice. The mice that received the fecal transplant Again, pardon the yuck factor, but yes, they just basically fed them the, uh, the feces from the human. And the mice that had the, they got the fecal transplant from the obese human gained weight. It, the mice that got them from the thin human did not. So again, they checked their, um, the mice fecal uh, gut bacteria as well. So again, you're starting to see a significant... Um, growing evidence that our gut bacteria do control or have, have a major influence on our weight. In fact, uh, Science Daily covered another article in Nature um, regarding yo-yo obesity. You know, you've, uh, uh, Oprah's been been uh, pilloried in the press for having some yo-yo weight loss, but you know what? That's really the most common experience that people have gotten. You try to change your uh, weight, quite often you can do it, but then quite often you slip right back. And in fact, the number one um, cause of failure of diets is over 90% of them don't last six months or more. A dietary change has to be permanent in order to make an impact. Well, we're all talking about forcing the issue here with behavior. They're saying, look, for some reason, the bacteria may change that behavior. In other words, the metabolism may create the behavior. The, the gut microbiome may change that behavior. And this is, this is what they did. Persistent, uh, this is the title for the, again, Nature uh, magazine article. Persistent microbiome alterations modulate the rate of post-dieting weight regain. So, <clears throat> uh, again, continuing evidence that um, our gut biome may be having, it does, it does appear to be having an impact on whether we gain weight or not, uh, whether we uh, can lose weight or not, and the yo-yo effect. So this was uh, this another nature study. This one was done by Jeffrey Gordon, not Jeff Gordon, the race car driver. The, uh, Jeff Gordon, a researcher at University of Wash or Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri. Basically, what he did was he noticed that um, rats, obese rats that were cage mates of thin rats, tended to become thin. He hypothesized it was because of the, uh, the fact that they were getting a fecal transplant. He noticed that um, they were um, losing weight. He also noticed that it didn't go the other direction. So um, he thought, well, wonder why these fat mice can get thin from fecal transplants from these thin mice, but it doesn't go the other way around. And as you notice here, basically what we're saying is uh, diet is important to make this happen. So what he did was this. He took cereal and pizza and made rat pellets, rat pellets for chow for these rats. When the... Uh, obese rats were given this um, rat pellet chow made of cereal, breakfast, human breakfast cereal and pizza. Even if they got the uh, gut transplant from the thin mice, they did not get thin. So that makes a very important point. Um, weight loss is not that simple. You can't just... Uh, we're not going to get to a point, I don't think, where you just go out, you get a maybe a fecal transplant if you're going to go that route, and then get an automatic, you're thin for life. Um, 
weight loss takes exercise, takes a permanent weight uh, or diet change, and fecal transplants may actually become part of that in the future. Um, so <clears throat> when I look at that, what, what have I done? What's my story? Um, I came from a family of origin with significant weight challenges. My dad was my height, 5'10", and over 300 pounds at one point. I'm currently 150. I've, I did get up to 180 during college, lost 30 pounds, and have kept it off since then. I have used non-nutritive sweeteners. Uh, saccharin, uh, when I went to college 30-something years ago, um, saccharin was used quite a bit. When I went for training for preventive medicine at Hopkins, a big part of the debate at that point was saccharin and uh, bladder cancer. Well, at Hopkins, we all prided ourselves on being good epidemiologists, and we noticed that this was this uh, bladder cancer connection was seen only in rats. It had not been reported in humans, and it would probably take a truckload of uh, saccharin ingestion to cause that bladder cancer. So, I didn't worry about saccharin. Now, <clears throat> um, I did, I, I'm a distance runner, and I did drink way too many diet sodas, lots of aspartame. So in 2015, when this study came out, I cut out all of that, cut out every one of my uh, non-nutritive sweeteners, including stevia. And if you'll notice, stevia was not mentioned in any of those previous studies. In fact, one of those researchers said, I switched from my artificial sweetener in my morning coffee to a natural sweetener. I'm, I can only interpret that to mean he switched to stevia. Let me give you the rest of the story for me. Uh, even after switching all of those and stopping all of those for a couple of years, uh, a couple of years later, I became significantly insulin resistant anyway. I think that had to do more with my genetics than it did with my butt uh, gut, pardon that, gut biome. My fasting glu uh, glucose was 110, one hour was 165, two hours was 155. I went to a low carb diet, started metformin, and have had a glucose value over 100 once since then, and that's been many months ago. So more on this later. <clears throat>